Good. I, um, you know, redistricting is a practice that's been going on, as we saw, since the beginning of our country, and both political parties do it. Right now, when politicians are looking at people just as pawns in order to win the next election, our voices get very muted, and instead of being able to think about how do we get representation, not only where we live um, so that it can be represented in our state capital, but also how do we then get representation in somebody caring about our community at the federal level, that all gets ignored when we just think about this as Democrat or Republican. Um, this movie obviously highlighted red map, um, but if Democrats had been a little more smarter and strategic, they would have had Project Blue Map too. And I just think it's important to like restate that because this is a political game, it's a political tool that has been used on both sides um, and continues to be right now. So, uh, and panel, do you guys have some microphones? We've got some here. Um, all right, so the first person we have is Don Lee. Don is the executive director of the East Town Community Association. He's also the chair and founder of Grand Rapids Democracy Initiative who are currently focused on redistricting right here in Grand Rapids. So Don, thank you for being here. Pleasure. <laughs> then we have Kelly Schalter. Um, Kelly actually was the co-founder of Voters Not Politicians. Uh, I made the Facebook post, yeah! We were co-workers and I made the Facebook post because I wanted Kelly and I to be able to work on something cool together. <laughs> um, and at work uh, during our lunch break when was the first time we checked back in on the Facebook post and saw that it was growing and growing. And we looked at each other and we said, are we really gonna try and do this? And then we Googled how to end gerrymandering. Um, <laughs> And so it was really intense and we decided to anyways. <laughs> um, so Kelly, not only from being a founding member of Voters Not Politicians who set up our initial infrastructure, our first website, our first Google forums to collect volunteers so that we could actually plug them into committees. She's also the program manager at the Michigan Recycling Coalition, served on the Voters Not Politicians board and the People, uh, our current organization's board of directors as well. Thanks Kelly. All right, then we have Doug Booth. Hi, Doug. Um, he's the Chief Operating Officer for HealthNet of West Michigan. He has dedicated his life to getting involved in the political sphere to make sure that others who are maybe less fortunate than ha him uh, can still have a voice and that he knows that he can give back. Not only has he helped run multiple political campaigns, he actually ran uh, for office as a candidate for Michigan's third congressional district recently. So let's give a round of applause for Doug. Then we have Ronald Jimerson. Uh, he's the executive director and co-founder of Seeds of Promise here in Grand Rapids. Yes. Uh, yeah. An organization that's fighting uh, the war on poverty the right way by focusing on building prosperity. Uh, he's done a lot of community work and right now is helping raise awareness about the Grand Rapids Democracy Initiative to increase uh, the number of wards here in Grand Rapids. He's also the author of Satan Thinks in Black and White and has a lot of other amazing community titles to his name. So thank you, Ronald, for being here. And last but certainly not least, I'm sure you recognize Jamie Lyons Eddy from the movie. She was our state uh, field director during the campaign, also one of the people who raised her hands right at the very beginning saying, okay, I think I can figure out how to do this, um, and was definitely the person who organized thousands of people into how do we actually gather these signatures. Now, Jamie is um, with Voters Not Politicians and is the director of campaigns and programs where she helps deliver all of the amazing work that uh, Voters Not Politicians continues to do um, and is just an amazing person in general. So thanks, Jamie, for being here. All right, so first question should be easy, panel, don't worry. I wanna know why each of you, in about a minute, um, <laughs> why you initially uh, got interested in gerrymandering and why you continue to think about redistricting um, and uh, how it impacts the elections. We well, can just go down the line. Okay, so I, mine's really quick. Um, as a director of a community organization, I quickly became uh, aware of the frustration that residents experience 
in terms of feeling uh, like their voices are heard with regards to policy decisions and seeing that play out in various um, aspects in my uh, professional life. I had chose to share an idea with some other folks and, and that's where we um, came to begin to understand that uh, we needed a solution for what we think is a broken democratic system. Um, so I have a degree in political theory and constitutional democracy. And um, when Katie said she really wanted to take on gerrymandering, I think it was really especially exciting at that time because it was after a really divisive presidential election and thinking about talking to my friends and family about an issue instead of a person just felt really exciting. So I think that was really um, the push that I needed. So. Um, my first entrance into exploring this idea of one vote equals, uh, or one person equals one vote, uh, actually was back in 2000 with the Gore versus Bush, when I saw popular vote and electoral very much do not match up. Years later, as I started working on and for political campaigns, I really started to see firsthand, you know, how these are shaped and how truly they carve them out for themselves, so, yeah. <clears throat> And I think, you know, my interest in uh, gerrymandering goes back a long ways. I'm really proud now, you know, uh, from both parties that was happening for people of color. And now it's really being addressed in a positive and the right way that we can really make some changes and get more people out to vote. Um, I answered a Facebook post. <laughs> I think it was the, the smiley face that did it. <laughs> I don't know. It is a pretty convincing emoji, yeah. Um, I think part of the reason I was drawn to it, though, is I, I agree with what some of the other panelists have said about just um, being able to sink our teeth into an issue that wasn't about a person and it wasn't about a party. It was about making democracy work better. Um, I'm also a math teacher and engineer, and it was a very um, mathy issue. Um, the math is pretty messed up in gerrymandering. Um, and then um, I think I continued along when I saw, I mean, I, so many of you raised your hands. Once we saw the power of people um, in the movement, it just became uh, too inspiring to resist. Thank you. All right, Don, this first question's for you. So proposal two that passed um, addressed congressional districts, so who we all get to vote for our Congress people. It addressed state senators um, and state House of uh, Representative members, but redistricting, which happens after the census, actually happens in many other levels, including at the local level for city commissioners, there's judges, there's school boards. All of these lines get redrawn after the census because Within 10 years, people move and population shift. Um, when it comes to local redistricting in Grand Rapids, why did GRDI decide to look at this issue, and what are you trying to accomplish before this next line of next set of lines are drawn in 2021? So, just I'll have to provide a little history for, for Grand Rapids to answer this question. So. Um, in 1911, the furniture workers of Grand Rapids had a strike, and at that time, the city of Grand Rapids had 12 wards with 24 aldermen, uh, and the population at that time was approximately half of what it is today. Um, and as I said before, in, in the work that I do with the uh, community association, we've, we've come to, to discover that uh, residents aren't, they don't, they aren't, they aren't feeling heard when it comes to issues of, um, of policy, uh, and this has borne itself out uh, around homelessness and affordable housing and gun violence and other important things that need to be addressed in the city. Um, in the city of Grand Rapids right now, we have three wards with two commissioners per ward and approximately 210,000 people in the city. Um, so that's about 70,000 constituents uh, per ward. Uh, in comparison, the city of East Grand Rapids has three wards with two commissioners um, and 12,000 people. That's a, approximately 4,000 people per ward. Um, another another um, issue is that our commissioners are part-time. So we, uh, we have the expectation that um, we are going to get effective representation from six people who are working part-time trying to represent 210,000 people. We're just not seeing that uh, bear itself out. So we. Uh, approach this situation with, you know, what's a sort of, what's a, what can we think of as a reasonable solution? So, uh, less constituents per representative seemed like a, a good place to start. Um, 
So our proposal divides the city into eight wards uh, with one commissioner per ward. Uh, that's approximately 25,000 constituents per commissioner, which we still think is quite a bit, but it's a, we feel it's a reasonable shift from what we have now. Um, we, uh, we've proposed one commissioner per ward because we feel that that provides accountability to a commissioner. Um, <clears throat> with two commissioners per ward, what we've seen and actually what we've heard from other commissioners is there's, there's varying degrees of um, effectiveness when you have two commissioners. Uh, and, it, and it runs the gamut from one commissioner does all the work while the other one gets all the credit for it to both commissioners have to duplicate effort and it's not very efficient. Um, so that's, where we, that's, that's how we landed on the 8-1 proposal that we're pursuing now. The timeliness matter of it is, as Katie indicated, is the census. Um, in the census, they're gonna redraw the, the, the districts, they're gonna re redraw the precincts, and when that happens, we want that process to be very intentional around what the demographics that the census reveals are with relation to representation in the city of Grand Rapids, and we want our representation to reflect our community, and we want, we want responsiveness from our elected leadership. Okay, so if I was hearing that correctly, 1911, that means in the last 100 years, this process hasn't changed and hasn't adopted, even though Grand Rapids continues to be one of the fastest growing cities in Michigan. Women couldn't vote when the city of Grand Rapids ward was redistricted. <laughs> All right, and really other quick follow-up question. I feel like there's some people who don't maybe technically live in Grand Rapids here. Are they still able to help with the pe gathering petitions even if they don't live in Grand Rapids but they're talking to Grand Rapids voters? Yes, anybody who wants to assist us with this effort can assist. You, you must be a City of Grand Rapids resident to sign our petitions. However, we would appreciate help from anybody and everybody in uh, moving our petitions forward. We do have one second uh, position, I'm sorry, petition that I'd like to mention and that is Currently, the city commission can appoint a commissioner if the seat is vacated um, prior to the end of a term. Some of you might know that uh, County Commissioner Southfield just resigned his uh, co county commission seat um, with only 10 months left to go in his term, and, and that seat will be appointed. That appointee will enjoy the advantage of incumbency going into the next election. We just don't feel that that's very democratic and we'd like to see a special election being held for commission seats um, and we don't see any, any reason that there is a, a, there's no reason for them to appoint a, a replacement to their own seat. The residents should decide that. So we have two petitions, in fact. Great, thank you. Um, all right, Kelly, um, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> in the beginning of this, but you know, throughout too. Um, and there were many times that I think we looked at each other and had to reassure each other that we're gonna find a way, it's fine. Our, our catchphrase is always, it's fine. Um, at one point when we first saw that we needed to gather 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 180 days, we did the math and we saw that if we both quit our jobs and could gather 3,000 signatures each uh, every single day for those 180 <laughs> days, that we would barely make it, but we thought that we could. Um, and we were hoping maybe at least one other person will join us. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jamie. Um, so I guess since you saw really from those initial moments and us being on the phone and then saying, are we actually gonna do this? Let's make this Facebook group. The post turned into a group. The movie totally missed that, but it's very important. <laughs> um, what do you think some of the hardest things were to figure out? But then also, why do you think that even though we had to Google how to end gerrymandering as soon as we made the Facebook post, why do you think we were still able to succeed? Um, so I think that the hardest thing um, as a group was that none of us really knew each other, uh, Katie and I did, but uh, thousands of us <laughs> didn't know each other before this campaign. And so we're trying to build this massive effort at the same time as we're starting to get to know each other. And that's really complicated. So, um, you know, I, one of my things I did during the campaign was I monitored our, our inbox, um, the info at Voters Not Politicians. And almost every day somebody would send an email with, this is how we're gonna fix it, like this is my idea. Um, but ultimately, and we did, we surveyed um, the groups and 
we got responses from people. And ultimately, what, what really ended up happening is that people were able to put aside you know, their ideas, of like, this is my thing that I'm going to do, and people were able to focus on the goal more than about what they were about. Everybody was able to make the campaign bigger than themselves. Um, what was your second question? I'm sorry. Why, do you, why do you think we were successful even though we had lots of hurdles? Oh yeah, that's it, really. We, you know, everybody was able to put the campaign first and that was the number one thing. So. And do you think, I mean, since we started with the Facebook post um, and since you were one of the initial people figuring out stuff, do you think that now more than ever um, there's maybe more opportunity to be able to drive these changes and maybe why yes or why no? Uh, yes, for sure. Um, we have a level of access to organizing that we've never had before. Um, free services. Social media can allow you to reach so many more people than you could have in the past. Um, Google Docs, we spent hours on free conference calls, um, and that's free. We never paid a dime for it throughout the whole campaign, and we used it all the way up until, until the election. Um, we used Google Forms to collect our first volunteer data uh, which we linked in a free WordPress website. So if you have access to the internet, and that means if you have access to a public library anywhere near you, then you have access to the tools that y we used to get off the ground. So. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. All right. Uh, Doug, so voters, not politicians, we had this like whole thing where everybody thought we meant voters, not politicians. Like, like bad politicians. We actually meant voters should draw the lines, not politicians. That totally got lost in context. So there's this whole vibe of even Arnold Schwarzenegger, who we are all starring in a movie with, which I think is pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, is like, yeah, voters versus politicians. Not what we meant. I just want to make that clear. It's not what we meant. But do you know, do you think that politicians do play a role when it comes to nonpartisan redistricting? Are there politicians who can be in favor of it? And also, do you think that politicians can benefit from impartial um, redistricting as well? Um, to your first question, I would say yes. Typically, those politicians, though, are in the minority party. They do not have the power to actually create that change. The real challenge comes when they gain that power. And we're seeing this right now in our own country in Virginia, where Democrats, for the first time in a generation, have gotten complete control of the state. And last year, there were calls that they were going to change the redistricting process, make it fair, make it nonpartisan. But now that they have power, there are calls from within the own party in Virginia to stop that, that they have this rare opportunity that they haven't had in how long, and yet, what's gonna happen? So I think, yes, there is going to be those politicians that are going to talk the talk, um, but the real challenge is if they're actually going to follow through. Um, I'm watching Virginia very closely. I'm hopeful. Um, luckily, their governor has signaled he's going to keep pushing um, because we do need that. I mean, frankly, if Virginia fails, I think that it is going to show in the broader picture that our democracy truly is crumbling right now. Um, it is time for the people to truly take our power back. Um, to your second question, which, could you remind me? Yeah, so <laughs> as somebody who ran for office, let's say you were running again in 2021, uh, sorry, 2022, and you got elected, you are now in a district that wasn't gerrymandered. You do not have the guarantee that your voters are locked in and you're gonna win the election no matter what you do as long as you win the primary. What does that, how does that make you act differently as a politician? What does that mean when you actually have impartial redistricting and you are the person who's in office? You know, when I actually first started exploring running for office, I met with various elected leaders um, throughout the district. And when they would ask what my strategy was, I would always say, I want to activate the non-voters. I want to go to the black and brown community in Grand Rapids, in Battle Creek. And I won't say who, but the, legitimately one of the responses was, why would you do that? They don't vote. And the fact is, is that shows that within these districts, they're drawn so that you can choose the pockets of voters that you're going to focus on. The rest don't matter. If we have fair maps and fair elections, then 
it's going to force politicians to be accountable to the people that elected them. They can't go and choose their pockets. They have to talk to everyone. They have to actually find out what the issues are and not try and shape what their rhetoric's going to be based on who they know is going to support them. Thank you. Ronald, you have been at the spearhead of helping create change in many different ways. Um, and changes like this often involve um, having to go to the communities who continue to be the most impacted, who are pretty skeptical. I think we even saw in the movie that a lot of people are skeptical that change can happen because they've heard a lot of promises, not seen a lot of things delivered, and they aren't treated with respect in between election cycles. Um, so as you've been helping talk to people about what increasing the number of wards can mean, um, especially in some of the communities that right now have no representation, but not only when it comes to redistricting, are continuously left out of re really being able to make change. What have you found is impactful, and how do you, um, and, and what kind of responses are you hearing? Well, you know, even what uh, Doug was talking about, one of the things that we have to understand, and I don't know if a lot of people pays attention to that, but everybody that's running for office, the majority of them only talks about the upper class and the middle class. I serve a low income, area and their voices are not being heard and nobody speaks to that population of, of people so it's really important that we have some representation especially on the city commissioner uh, see he's been around for eight years and uh, only one commissioner has been in our office to really understand the program and you have to understand we're 5013 c but the only organization that I know of that has been written up in the United Nations uh, magazine for the work that we're doing in around healthcare in that community. And so their voices have to be heard. And we can't continue to allow uh, upper class and middle class people to make decisions and programs and projects for the lower class without even consulting them. So we know by moving into uh, eight wars is really going to be helpful and we can have some representation, true representation on the city commission. And you know, I just wanna say um, uh, Katie and uh, Kelly and Jamie, I mean, these women are some real warriors. <laughs> I mean, they, they are. <laughs> And I really hope that we get more young people and some men engaged also that's going to be those real warriors that's going to make some real positive change in gerrymandering and everything else that's going on and ensuring that that low class individual is also going to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. <laughs> Jamie, uh, so obviously you helped uh, us figure out how to take thousands of people and be able to not only make this really large goal achievable, um, but it made it so that people could recognize that each of us were a part of it, that without us, it wouldn't happen. But also when we did show up, our goal, our 10 signatures a week or 20 or 30 or one would all add up to this wider mission. So now that proposal two has passed, um, there is a big job to do. For the first time ever, Michiganders have the opportunity to be a part of this process that traditionally has happened behind closed doors with a group of consultants. And this time it's gonna be out in the open with regular Michiganders at those tables with those pens and Michiganders being allowed into that room and their input actually having to matter. So when it comes to now having an independent citizen redistricting commission, what's the most important thing for people to know in this audience about either how to apply or how to make sure that their voice is heard? So you may have heard the Secretary of State actually just released some of their, um, their demographic and geographic information for um, about half of the people who've applied. They've, they've had over 6,000 applications. Um, yeah, that's it's pretty awesome. Um, and they've released the demographic information for about 3,000 of those. Um, what we've seen so far is that um, it's great. We've, we've got almost every county in the state represented. Um, we're really proud at Voters Not Politicians on the work we've done around the state. We've, had, we've hosted over 44 application workshops so far, um, and we have 
uh, 30 more planned right now. We plan to do at least 120. Um, if you are interested in applying to serve on the redistricting commission, um, you can get some information at our table out there, or you can go to um, our shortcut for our, our um, website is vnp.vote. If you just type that into your browser, it will take you to votersnotpoliticians.com. Um, but you should, you should consider applying for sure, um, especially since these, uh, since these statistics have come out. Um, if you are under 40, <laughs> if you are female, if you are a person of color, um, if you are a Republican, um, all of those are, are so far um, less represented in this pool. I, I will point out that the amendment is very carefully written. When they, uh, when they draw down to the last 200 semifinalists, that step is required to represent Michigan, so to reflect uh, in, in all the different ways to reflect the state, which is fantastic. But you should really consider applying. The applications are open until June 1st of 2020, and it's very easy to apply. Has anybody applied in the room? Um, it's, it's only about, excellent. Um, it's only about 15 or 20 minutes of your time to go through that application process. You do have to print it out and have it notarized in order for it to be um, accepted because you're swearing to your party affiliation under oath. Um, but I do want to point out something really important. Out of those more than 6,000 people, and you know the application process is still open, they're still coming in, only 13 of those people will serve. So it's important that you continue to engage with the redistricting commission after that. Um, that commission will be doing its work. They'll be seated this fall. They'll be working starting this fall through most of 2021. And they will be holding public hearings around the state, a minimum of 15 of those. And you can interact with the commission. You can bring your communities of interest. You can draw your own maps. You can send an email to the commission. You can interact with them online. You can show up at those hearings. We, taught, we heard a lot about all the stuff going on behind closed doors um, before, the way Michigan was gerrymandered and the way it's been handled around the country. It's not behind closed doors anymore. It's gonna be completely transparent and you can be part of it and you need to make sure that you do so. Um, I think we're gonna do an audience question in just a second, and Paige, you'll run around with it? Okay. Um, one, just to follow up, uh, so Jamie, if, uh, so out there we have a notary, right? Yeah, we do. We have, um, one of the things we do, um, <laughs> thanks Katie, one of the things we do, every one of these application workshops, and if you go to our website at votersnotpoliticians.com, we're running them around the state. We have free notary services available at every one of those. We have a free notary out in the lobby right now. We actually have an application. If you've got 15 minutes, you can fill it out right here. Um, so please do, um, and just, I'm gonna make one little plug, that all political power is inherent in the people. Um, it, it's not only, you heard it very many times, it's the first line of the Michigan Constitution. It's VNP's motto, and if you want to sport it <laughs> on, your, on a sweatshirt or a tote bag or a t-shirt, you can also get those at votersnotpoliticians.com. Nice, and I just wanna say that um, since uh, our story in Michigan. Um, when you when you accidentally start a political movement with a Facebook post, it makes a really easy headline. Um, and so we we our story was not only not only will it be able to be told through this documentary, but it was on a lot of on the New York Times, the Atlantic, um, papers across the country, and. It has inspired other political movements. There's an open primary uh, campaign in Florida that just made it on the ballot, and they didn't give up because of hearing about our story here in Michigan, and that thousands of people were willing to step up. Yeah. Um, there's other local initiatives happening around the country, including with redistricting. Oklahoma is working on redistricting with a ballot initiative this year. There's talk in Arizona, I'm sorry, Arkansas and Alaska. Virginia, as was mentioned, is very important that Democrats who said they were gonna support this before they were in power actually continue to support it. So folks that live in other states, please let them know too that, hey, yes, Michigan has this solution, but you need to be looking at redistricting right now, and especially around the census. If you don't get counted, then your voice can't be heard. 
Um, all right, so let's do, is, do, is anybody have a question? And Paige will come run the microphone, so just feel free to raise your hand. And I do ask, although we love your comments, if it can actually have a question for the panel, that would be appreciated. And we do have two microphones, so if there's one up here and one here, so you guys can come down if you want, but raise your hand if you'd rather me I think there's one. right here, Helen, I think. I think it's Helen. <laughs> yeah, hey, Helen. Right up there, Paige, middle. I've heard a lot of things about roadblocks being thrown in the way of this commission, and I just wonder where those roadblocks stand. I know there was something initially with the state legislature cutting back funding for the Secretary of State, which directly impacts the budget of the commission. So I'm just wondering what those roadblocks are and what might be happening with them. Do you want me to take that? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the commission's budget itself may not totally be established yet. There's still some conversation about it. What the legislature did, it's required that the commission gets an amount equivalent to 25% of the Secretary of State's budget. So what the legislature did last year is they cut the Secretary of State's budget um, and then gave that money back to the Secretary of State a different way. So it was only to cut the commission's funding by about a million dollars. Um, but we've heard that there is some revisiting of that. They did end up getting the $2 million supplemental. Um, but there are two lawsuits that are still active. Um, so there's two lawsuits that were consolidated into one, one by Tony Daunt from the Freedom Fund um, and some other people who are arguing that they politicians should be able to be on the commission, and the other by the Republican Party suggesting that they, the party, should be able to pick the four Republicans on the commission. Um, those two have been consolidated, and the, they both uh, the good. They had a good first start in in court right here in federal court in Grand Rapids. That judge uh, denied the preliminary injunction, but that's being appealed in the Sixth Circuit um, Court in Cincinnati on March 17th. Those are both trying to stop the commission. We're really optimistic that is not going to happen. Um, we're we've won before, and Paul Smith, who was in the in the film, is our lead counsel from. Um, um, from Campaign Legal Center, which is awesome. Um, but the fight's not over. Um, the people who have the power to gerrymander only give it up um, kicking and screaming. And some of that kicking and screaming is still going on. And I think uh, just an important addition is that those lawsuits were anticipated even when we were first writing this language. We know that it's a tactic, that if you can throw it out in court, then you don't even have to try and win with the voters. Um, so not unexpected. And some of the really cool quotes from the lawsuits that have already happened still are saying, you know, this case is without merit. Like, what are they talking about? Which also is what happened when we were going up through the Supreme Court in Michigan. So thankfully, we had a lot of really smart people, including some of you in this room who thought about every single way that this could possibly be attacked. So. All right, do you have another quick question? Anybody? Zach. <clears throat> I, I just, I see six people up on stage who have been fighting uphill battles for a long time, varying amounts of time. And I'm just wondering how you guys maintain the energy and how you would suggest that Volunteers who maybe don't have the privilege of doing this for a living can maintain the energy to keep fighting a long uphill battle. Thank you. Anybody who wants to take that can go. You. <laughs> Everybody. That's how. So when you have like a bad day and you don't feel like things are going anywhere and then somebody says something like what you just said and then that's how, that's how you can continue to, to go. So when you see people in your community who, ha who feel that there's something important that needs to get done and um, they need support, then that's, that's how it happens. And I was just gonna add to you, you really gotta have a passion for the work that you're going about, you know what I mean? And I mean, with that passion, you're going to get the energy. And so we're hoping that, you know, we're going to be recruiting many, many people with passions to begin really getting, giving back the campaign to the people rather than the politicians. I, I just want to add that the other thing is that you need to empower others. I think Katie, Katie set that standard right from the beginning that um, anybody who wanted to take on sort of an ownership role in our movement could do so. And you, not, you need to do that not only to be inclusive, but to allow others to, to carry it forward. It's critical. 
Yeah, with me, um, you know, it really is what Don said. It's all of you. Uh, the fact is, is while as a campaign manager or working on a campaign, you know, you get motivation from that candidate or from the cause that you're really pushing for. Uh, from the candidate side, I will say that it was an individual walking up to me. I am, I was very much ex um, owning my identity. I am a gay man, and running as a gay man openly in West Michigan, something that, that 20 years ago I would have never even thought that was possible. But the fact is, is I had somebody come up to me, say, when I truly felt like everything was going down, um, and he said, I've never seen somebody like you in my area. You give me hope. That was enough. I mean, it made me walk away because I was tearing up. But it is one that little things like that, they really just reignite that flame like no other. I like it. <laughs> I like working hard to make good things happen. So it's easy. <laughs> I think for me, there were a couple things. Uh, I'm adding myself to the panel. Um, <laughs> uh, I think there was always something in the back of my mind of like, I, I see that thousands of people are passionate. If you just go online and look at a comment section, there's plenty of people with really passionate opinions. But the difference is, are you gonna do something about it? Um, and I think for me, I just had this inkling and a little bit of it comes out of the movie, but around like, I've gotta at least try. You know, I hear about how much money is spent on elections, and I know I don't have money. Like, I hear about how, how conniving all of these different interested parties are, and, and I'm, like, not, that's not who I am. You know, I'm just honest and going to tell you how it is. Um, but I believe in America. I believe in this concept that democracy and a government could be derived from the citizens that it is governing, or all political powers inherent in people. I believe in that, and so... If I'm not seeing that happen, yet I do have extra time, even if it's a little bit. This didn't used to be my day job. You know, I was working full time, trying to get my MBA, doing some improv troops. But I was like, you know, I've got at least like two hours that I don't have to sleep. So why don't I at least try? And knowing that I was trying actually helped me feel a lot better. Knowing that I, I could, because at the end of the day, if it did end up failing, fine. I could give up on the experiment of democracy in America and I could just like be cynical and it's fine. But until I actually pushed myself to try, I would never actually know that. It'd always just be a, an unproven theory to me. So that was part of it. And I do think that the other part was um, that there were other people raising their hand too. I wasn't alone. There were thousands of people in every single county of Michigan who even though we were internet strangers, were willing to say, Let's try, let's, let's just see. And, and knowing that, knowing that we didn't have to know each other, that they were giving their time and energy and money just because they wanted to have Michigan be fair and equal for everyone. They wanted a Michigan where no matter how old or young you were, you could possibly be on this commission or that we could draw lines to just benefit everybody equally. That was an inspiring idea. And I think going back to that and seeing the other people um, was always really, really motivating and always made you feel like, you know what, if they can do it, I can do it. In our Facebook group, the UP was one of our regions and I'll never forget, it was an election day and I had a, um, we were standing outside, what, 100 feet from the polls, whatever you're legally allowed to be, and we were telling people about the petition. And uh, I, my shift was at seven in the morning and I was like, I don't wanna do this, this is horrible. <laughs> it's cold, whatever, but the UP, they were the first ones up and they had written on their car, which was covered in snow, like vote yes for two or whatever. And they were out there first and they had posted a picture in our Facebook group and I was like, hey, we don't have snow. Like what the heck is my excuse? <laughs> I tear myself out of bed and end up having the most fun day ever with just tons of people going into the library and that was kind of that refresher too that sometimes you just have to start doing it and it reminds you exactly why you love doing it to begin with even if you're tired even if whatever because there are lots of other people who don't have even the fortune to be able to step out of bed and volunteer to do this and you've got to be fighting for them too all right probably one more question hey 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 um, so while I am uh, hopeful about the future and um, am so enthusiastic about what we were all able to accomplish, I can't help but wonder what's going to happen this year. 
and I was wondering if you all had an idea or a thought or a fear or something you could share about this year. From a national perspective, I do know that there is now Project Red Map 2.0 and Project Blue Map 1.0, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's real. And so thinking about things like, uh, in Michigan, our governor is not up in 2020, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, actually, I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> our, our governor is not up, but different key seats in states where the redistricting is still done by the politicians in office, they're, they're targeting those same key seats so that they can flip the legislature in a zero, zero year, as well as trying to elect different governors. I think there's 22 different governors up for election across the state. So that comes back to people having to be informed. The other thing is even after this election, regardless of who ends up getting to draw the lines, we now know how much data is behind this. And we now know that lawsuits are going to have as much information as possible hidden. But we also know that we can show up. There are committee hearings in every single state where these lines are going to be drawn, and whether they're for show or not, you showing up and being able to testify and being able to say, hi, I'm Katie Fahey, I'm from Grand Rapids, and here's how I want my district to look, here's why. I don't have any idea why you would draw it any other way, because I'm from here and I know what I'm talking about. Each of us can do that, though. Each and every one of us can do that, and that's what needs to happen across the country. We need to show that people are watching. One of the things that you could kind of see in the movie, but they don't really emphasize the point of, is every Every single hearing, there's a board of elections that like, we didn't, I didn't know existed until we started this. And they are used to having 10 people show up in their meetings. They had to actually rent a giant hotel conference center to fit our 400, 500 people we were bringing with us. And they brought their kids to work with them because they were like, look, what I do is cool. Like, look, there's all these people here. But that was what mattered. The Supreme Court. Like we got to talk to one of the justices who was the deciding vote afterwards, and she said uh, the only day that the Michigan Supreme Court was full was the day that the redistricting proposal was heard, and don't think we didn't notice. Right. And that is people power. If we just complain online, if we just complain to our friends and family, but we don't actually show up and put our feet and our, again, money and energy and time into showing that we are paying attention and we do care, then we get treated like we don't. So I think all of that's important. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add, but for I just want to quickly add, um, in the movie we saw a lot of uh, voter suppression tactics being implemented and voter ID laws and things like that. And I think that the hopeful thing that we can, I think the thing we can hope for is a, just a mass mobilization of voters this year. Um, just. <laughs> Overrun, overrun the systems that are in place that will suppress your voice, and, and that requires each and every one of us to go out and encourage all of our friends, our, our whatever their partisan leanings are, or if they're apolitical or they don't believe in the system, to get them to believe in the system and get them to go out and vote. Because as Katie said, it's like, you know, I, I think everyone here would agree that we believe in democracy or we wouldn't be sitting on this stage. So. Go ahead, Jamie. I just, I, I also want to add for this year, um, something that's really important in addition to Proposal 2, which was very powerful, obviously, there was Proposal 3 last year, which gave Michigan some of the best voting access in the country. Um, we're actually working on, Voters Not Politicians is working on a Proposal 3 implementation project called Nights and Weekends, where we're trying to get clerk's offices to be open more, because right now you have uh, automatic registration in Michigan, you have no reason absentee voting, um, and you can register up to election day. Um, those powers are much more powerful if people know about them. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm really encouraged. Everybody on this stage and many of you, if you, in, instead of getting into the candidate stuff, if you get into democracy stuff, um, things that are systemic democracy reforms, um, Prop 3 implementation, Prop 2 implementation, um, all of the work everybody's doing up here, we can make democracy work better. Um, so I would encourage everybody to look for ways to do that this year. Great. All right, and I'm going to do one more question for the rest of the panel. Um, oh, did you have something to add? Yeah, go ahead. Make sure you get counted. Yes, yeah. the and census the census is this year. Census. Make sure you're counted, your family, your neighbors, everyone. Um, all right, final question. So we have an audience full of people, um, but for someone with an idea that they want to make things better right now, what is the one thing that they can do to get started? And I'll let each of you answer. Sorry, I'm taking the first one. Run for office. <laughs> 
We need good people. No seat should go unchallenged. Regardless of how far up or down the ballot is, no seat should go unchallenged. Run for office, support the campaigns, the candidates, the initiatives, down ballot. Um, I know there's a, something happening at the top, but down ballot, all politics are local. We have to flip everything. So run for office. <laughs> yeah. and I think you know what's really going to be important, what we're already beginning to work on, is how do you get those lower end class, uh, lower class for individuals who have been forgotten, not talked about, not really supported, how do you now begin to motivate them to understand they might not have much money, but their vote is really important. Not only their vote, but even doing the censors. I mean, you know, they've heard so many lying politicians coming in the, the neighborhood and say they're going to do this and that. And once they get in the office, everything changes. So it's how do we begin to really motivate that class of people to really get out and, and vote and get engaged in this whole process. And Ronald, I know that you've spent so much of your life helping make that happen. Mm -hmm. For those of us who hear that and want to help, what do you think are ways that um, maybe people who aren't from a lower income can still go and make sure that those voices are being heard and counted? Well, well, one of the things that, just to help people understand, my organization has been around for 10 years, and we're bottom up. In other words, 75% of my whole board is made up of residents who were trained by Kellogg's grant. And then 25% are outside people. So really, the biggest challenge that we have is that many people don't understand all the resources that are available. Mm -hmm. and, and just sharing those resources, where do you go for absentee voting? And I mean, just, it's just the tons of things that um, individuals in our neighborhoods have no idea. And, Therefore, we really got to, you know, look at ways and come up with ways that really motivate them and get them out to get engaged and participate. I mean, the petitions that I've been working with Don, when you tell the residents, you know, they think, I mean, that's a gold mine. You mean, we're going to have the opportunity and we can stop this year, man, and yeah, we'll sign the petition. And so we're going to have every event, we're going to have petitions there to change the three wards to, you know, eight wards. They want to do things, but we just got to get the information and resources out to them. So show up to the community and then do the hard work of making sure it's easy to explain and give people access to those resources. Absolutely. You can do the work to help make it easier for them. Great. Thank you. All right. What can we, what can somebody do today to, if they want to make change? I kind of pre-answered this question on the last question. <laughs> um, that's the thing I would just go back to, if you can get involved in democracy reform efforts, um, wherever you are, Grand Rapids Democracy Initiative, you could join the people, you could join Voters Not Politicians. Um, if, it, if you have a few hours a week to actually do something, um, I mean, commenting on Facebook is fine. You can do that too. <laughs> but also go out and do something. And if you can do something structural to improve your democracy for the future, even better. Yeah, I, I think um, for me, it, my advice would be if you see something that bothers you, something that like really just doesn't seem right, Google it. Google everything you can about it. Find out all the information. Find out if there's anybody that's already working on it. Find out who else might be interested in it and just get connected to those people and, and do what you can from there. So that's my. I don't know that I have anything to add. This is a pretty good list of answers. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is uh, paper ballots and electronic voting. So I think like vigilance around the democratic, like the technical process of democracy is important. Um, so. Great, and I'll just add that there's petitions out there you can sign, you can sign up to volunteer. I'm gonna thank you too to everybody who bought a host ticket. Um, oh, sorry, and I forgot we have some posters that we're raffling off. So John Carlson, are you still in the audience? We'll mail him in. I know where to find him. <laughs> yeah, All right, good. Uh, Kristen Van Armen? No. I know where to find her. Okay, Molly Patterson? She left. Okay. Uh, Cindy Wing? No. Okay, we're just going to hand them out. Um, and Susan Johnson. All right, Susan, to you. So, Susan, you've won like a giant poster with the movie on it's it. It's really um, good. We have a couple extras too. Um, I do know that Wealthy Theater is a nonprofit here that helps people be able to host events. So, I just want to thank the staff and our projector worker and everybody who was there. Yes. It was amazing. And 
Thank you to everybody who spent your afternoon learning even more about democracy and figuring out how you can get involved. Thank you. Oh, thank you, you too. Okay. Matt, oh, Kathy, can you get a picture of the